Welcome in to this week's episode of Your Drone Questions Answer, brought to you by Drone Launch Academy. I'm your host, Chris Prelove, as always. Today's question is this, how are drones being used to monitor the changing coastal environments in Maine? To help us answer that question, I'm really excited to welcome our guest today, Will Katitsky at the University of England. Will, thanks so much for joining the show today. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Will, before we kind of get into how y'all are using drones up there with the university and your lab, just tell our listeners a little bit about your background just in general and how you kind of got into the research space and what you're studying today. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So, I am currently an assistant professor at the University of New England where I run our GIS program. We offer a minor here at the University of New England where students will take classes kind of from introductory GIS to kind of our more advanced classes, do a lot of drone mapping, which well, I'm sure we'll get into. My background here to get here though, I really was interested at in finishing, you know, my undergraduate and my graduate education was really around glaciology. And so I was primarily interested in how glaciers are changing around the world and particularly how they're contributing to sea level rise. And so I spent a lot of time during my PhD mapping glaciers in the Arctic. A lot of that work was by satellites. These features on Earth's surface are so large, glaciers are so big that even you know 10 meter uncertainties often were more than good enough for us. And so we would use satellites like Aster or Landsat. And you know, even though they're really coarse resolution, they would provide great data for us. During my PhD, we did a lot of work understanding these glaciers, particularly those that ended in the ocean. When I kind of left that, graduated from my PhD, came here to the University of New England, I kind of quickly realized that uh, our students were not really interested in studying glaciers. Glaciers are fascinating. They're really important in a number of ways, ecologically and globally because of sea level rise. But you know, there are maybe two or three glaciologists employed by the federal government. The rest are in academia. Like our students aren't going to go get jobs working on glaciers, but what they could get jobs on is, you know, using drones, these really innovative tools to monitor you know, environments around us. And so for us here in coastal Maine, that's our beaches and our marshes. They're super dynamic for anyone who lives on the coast. Storms come in and they completely reorganize the coastal environment. And so that's what I really wanted to do, to work with our students, to monitor our coastal landscapes, understand how they're changing, understand how sea level rise is going to impact them in the future, and see what we can do now to help protect those environments for both for tourism and people who live here, and also for the wildlife and the ecosystems that utilize these places. Yeah. Could you just state like, where, where is y'all's campus? Where are y'all situated along that main yeah. coastal area? So north of Boston is New Hampshire and then Maine. Maine has this uh, huge coastline, and we are in the far southern part of Maine. Uh, we're in the city of Biddeford. Our campus is right where the Saco River, which is um, one of the largest rivers in this region. And then we also have a marsh on campus, uh, Biddeford Pool Marsh. Um, we have a beach called Hills Beach. Um, so this is a, a super dynamic coastal environment. Got it. No, that's helpful. What is it about drones and that high resolution scale as well as obviously the temporal hey we can mobilize once the storm has stopped or whatever the case may be quickly but what is it about all of that that makes drones at least at times a really good tool for those types of uh, beach or coastal monitoring applications yeah this question of scale is like probably the biggest one we face right of how do we find the tools that are at the appropriate scale to solve our problems and so for for me Drones are the answer here for coastal monitoring for a number of reasons. Obviously, the spatial scale is far superior to any satellite. I mean, we're well below the legal limit of what satellites are allowed to capture. So when we're collecting imagery or we also have LIDAR, we're collecting at kind of the centimeter scale, which is just is never going to be possible from satellites unless we have some really crazy leap in technology and change in policy. I mean, satellites aren't going to achieve that kind of scale. The other is our response time. And so a number of your other guests on the show have kind of mentioned this, like, how do we respond, right? For us, yeah, it's absolutely storms. And so January 10th and January 13th of 2024, we had back-to-back -back record-breaking storms. So this, the January 13th, 2024 event was the highest water level we've ever observed in Maine. I happened to get kind of lucky that I started drone monitoring on some of these beaches December 2023 and early like January 4th, 2024. And so we had done like just before, but our communities here were suddenly left with like, we don't even know what happened on the coast, right? Like they were driving out and trying to inspect these places themselves, but some, you know, sometimes the records, like they didn't even know what it looked like before. We've done a lot of kind of, I mean, you'd almost say like forensic work trying to figure out how the landscape changed in response to this event. And that's important for so many reasons, which we don't, we don't probably have time to get into all of them here. But, you know, for example, when communities are devastated by these types of events, one of the things they can do is go to FEMA and say, hey, this is what our beach looked like. 
this is what it looks like now. We need help and financially to put it all back together and make it safe again to protect our community. And so those, those are the kinds of things that we're trying to do. We provide a resource to our community where we can tell them what the landscape looked like and how it changed. And then ideally tell them also what are the best practices in making it more resilient. And so to go back to your question of scale, right? Drones are really the only tool that we currently have. We'll see how things change in the future, but that are able to solve this problem of temporal resolution when you want it, right? And be able to go out and control when you get that survey, the spatial resolution of what you want as well, that we can control based on our, our flight altitude, what we're getting, even if we're flying at the legal maximum 400 feet your spatial resolution is going to be way superior than what you can get otherwise. So drones are just a great, great tool to be able to solve this problem. Yeah. Is the key there is like before and after any particularly large storm event? Is, and is that kind of the trick of like, hey, in region X, we tend to get tropical storms or whatever. We need to like have a pre-hurricane season and a post or like, I guess, how do you plan out over like the long haul or with a community who might be working with a group like you or even a private entity or themselves? How do people plan out those acquisitions to be most meaningful? It's kind of the million dollar question, right? Of, I mean, everyone, you're kind of the local hero when you come up and you say, oh, I have this data set, you know, that's just what you need. But so many times we go out and we collect a data set that's kind of meaningless, that it didn't actually illuminate our knowledge from the last data set. So my approach in general has been that we know coastal environments are going to change dramatically in the next century. So for example, here in Maine, the legislature has passed laws that say you have to prepare for one and a half feet of sea level rise by 2050 and 3.9 feet of sea level rise by 2100. I don't know what other states have done. If states that haven't should, should take on uh, legislation similar, right? The idea that we know even if we stop our emissions tomorrow, which carbon emissions are the key driver of glacial melt, which is driving sea level rise. Even if we stop carbon emissions tomorrow and we cause no more warming that's impacting glaciers, even if that stops tomorrow, glaciers are still going to melt for the next century. They're so out of balance with the current climate system that we're going to have sea level rise going forward. It's kind of a simple matter of fact. And so it's on us then to prepare for that sea level rise. And so my approach has been that if we know this is coming, we just don't know when it's going to happen. Let's go out and monitor. And for us, it's been, you know, it's typically January, February, March that we get the biggest winter storms here. We get nor'easters that just kind of scrape our coastline and send these really big winds and snow typically into us. And so you get these wintry conditions can really batter the coast. We know we just need to go out and survey, right, in November, December, and then we're going to get those storms January, February, March, and then we can plan our spring surveys again, you know, March, April. Birds start to come back in April and May. And so we, that kind of changes how we do things and we have to be careful. And beach goers as well. The beaches become lined with people. And so they mess up your data in addition to kind of sometimes being unpleasant to work with. But, you know, we try to stay off the beaches in the summer and then we're back on October, November, preparing for that next winter season. So yeah, I think my advice for people out there would be like, we know these systems are changing. Get out there and monitor them. You never know when there's going to be some big change and you're going to be the local hero for having this data set that no one else has. You know, the government is doing things to help us prepare for this as well. You know, with NOAA flying so much LIDAR, uh, now you can pretty much get LIDAR from most places of the country, certainly the entire coast. In the last decade, you can basically anywhere, you can go get a LIDAR survey, even if it's relatively coarse, you do have some baseline data, even if it's a place that's new. So maybe that's kind of some broad advice on how we can go about preparing for these extreme events that might be once in a generation sometimes too. This, you know, the last storm we had was in the 1970s was the last record water level here in Maine. It's been a long time since that record breaking event, but people still remember it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I've had others, especially actually in Florida, talk about back to the FEMA side of things, right? That the pre-storm and post-storm comparison is really critical for a lot of like grant applications and whatever is going on. In some cases, it's been told to me that like spatial, like accuracy, it's really just about the visual. Is there any value in a pure visual? I'll just make up an example. Oh, I live at XY beach. Our beach is only three miles long. I get out there with my mini four pro and I just fly it up and down the beach for fun. But like, would that have any value that you've seen? Or does it really have to be up to a certain level of a mapping grade collection to really help in any meaningful way, if say the storm were to come in two months after or whatever? I think it's a, a fantastic question. And I should also preface this by saying I'm not a surveyor, right? I'm not a licensed professional surveyor. I probably never will be. I'm really just doing a you know photogrammetry flight to generate that or a LIDAR flight to generate a point cloud for me to work with. Absolutely, photos sometimes are our best friend. And so I've actually worked with locals on the beaches here to find pictures of when they were a kid from the 1950s 
of what that beach looked like then. Because even if it has them with their dog in it, that might be some of the only data we have from those time periods. So photos, even if you're just kind of a hobbyist out with a drone, go take some pictures of your, your local coastal environments because you never know what's going to change. Or your local mountain, if you get landslides, for example, right? These big type of processes that can change, we never know what's going to happen. Even development, you can see you know how things get developed through time. This type of high-scale data is often really useful. Even our lowest in drones, when you run them through a photogrammetry model, you can get some really remarkable results. So, you know, we have really entry-level consumer drones from DJI or, or others, where if you fly those around and you take enough pictures of the same place, you can build some really interesting 3D point clouds that will give you some really unique insight into these places. The last thing maybe I'll say on this topic is that we often are not as concerned about absolute accuracy as we are relative accuracy. And so I think that's kind of a big difference for us and a lot of others in the geospatial industry that we're really interested in how much are the dunes changing, not where are the dunes. And so that kind of relieves us of a lot of pressure of having to have really accurate ground control and like really dialing everything in that we can actually just do a flight on RTK and it's more than good enough for us. And even if we're two meters off or 10 feet off of where we actually should be in absolute space, our relative space, we can come back and post-processing and fix that so that we're, you know, the parking lot essentially hasn't moved. Even if we're saying the parking lot is not where it actually is, we can still look at how much the beach has changed and we get a really good, we get a good answer there and insight that helps our community. So you don't need to be doing things that are what a surveyor would do that would be super accurate to still have some really powerful insights to help your community. Yeah, it's more about telling that story, right? That change over time and that story, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's what our community members wanna know. They come to us and say, hey, the dune that's the only thing in front of my house got destroyed. What do I do? Like, how do I fix it? What's the best approach for me to take to ensure my house is safe? We've had a law here in Maine since the 1970s where you can't actually build new seawalls. So you can't put up a new seawall because the theory, which I think is has largely been proven correct, is that if you put up a seawall, you're going to impact your neighbor adversely more than you're going to help yourself. And so the, the idea being that if we can maintain these natural dune systems and protect them, that's our best bet in coastal resilience. And so a lot of these people are struggling of what, how do we maintain dunes? How do we build back seawalls that were destroyed? You know, how do we maintain these coastal systems, promote resilience so that we can have a thriving tourism industry so that we can have a coastal economy that is healthy and thriving and, and works for everyone. Yeah, that makes sense. And it is so important. So how about, I guess, photo versus LIDAR, when are you worried about deploying each of those sensor types? And then also what is your like, let's just say your go-to move there at the university for one of these types yeah. of projects? It's a great question. So I would say our bread and butter in the past couple of years has been the DJI Mavic Free Enterprise. I, for the entry kind of starting point, you're talking about $5,000 or so for that drone to have RTK on it. And Maine, our cores network is open, so we can just stream RTK corrections for free, which gives us, you know, really phenomenal results for not a big investment, all things considered. And so that's been kind of our go-to. It allows us to map kind of where dunes are. Um, and on sand, it gives us really great elevation because you have you're really looking at a flat surface that's impenetrable and has very little variation in terms of like topographic variation. So on the elevation measurements we get on sand are, I would say, comparable in a lot of ways to uh, to LIDAR. We do have LIDAR, so we have an Inspired Flight 1200A with a yellow scan mapper and camera. And the yellow scan has been phenomenal for us, particularly in penetrating the vegetation on the dunes. So we have dune grass. We work in the marshes as well, and there's grasses in the marshes. And so particularly you see large variations in vegetation season to season. And so the photogrammetry really fails there where in the winter, the vegetation is dead. You might be able to penetrate that more. In the summer, the vegetation is growing and robust and healthy. And so it might look like your beach had this huge gain from uh, winter to summer where really that was just vegetation growing, right? And so that's where the LIDAR really unlocks the capability for us of being able to penetrate that grass and allow us to see what's actually happening beneath and tell, you know, that dune grass actually did help trap more sand. There is more sand there than there was. And so the LIDAR and photogrammetry combo has been really valuable for us because photogrammetry is so much cheaper to fly and deploy and our students can go do that. LIDAR is so much more stressful and expensive and difficult and time consuming. And so while, you know, we aim to do maybe LIDAR every six months or so, we aim to do our photogrammetry surveys every, you know, two to three months. So it allows us this higher frequency of data collection um, while still kind of having that backbone of LIDAR so that we can kind of double check everything as we go. So I really see them as working together in coastal monitoring and environmental monitoring. 
And I think they're both, they both provide really valuable um, data sets and can make valuable contributions. Yeah, I love that. So I guess maybe the last two questions I'll kind of throw at you sort of together is one, just as far as students getting involved with drones, how students, I guess, are brought along from a pilot in from the, the usage of the drone perspective. And then question two with that would be back to the GIS side of all of this. Where does this data go? You know, is this, is this being hosted through some kind of online GIS portal? How does this information get actually specifically leveraged in a geospatial sense to hopefully inform some kind of action or decision? So on the education side, you know, we really want our, our students love doing hands-on things. I mean, who doesn't want to go to the beach and fly the drone, right? Like that is so much fun um, and what kind of inspires a lot of us to keep doing this work, right? Being in these amazing environments, working with cool tools. Of course, there's a lot of work to get there. We have several drone pilots who are licensed kind of as faculty and staff that we are able to go out and train students and be the pilot in command, but have a student actively flying it. Some students will get their part 107, absolutely. So we have students, none have failed yet in their part 107 test, which I always remind them because I think it's a nice bit of motivation and pressure to make sure that they pass that. They will go out and get their certification so that they can come fly. And so it kind of relays an all of the above approach of some people get it, some faculty and staff have it, so we can all get out and we can do our work and fly together. Uh, and so that that's worked well for us. We're always looking to get more students engaged. And so that's a challenge. We're obviously collecting a ton of data and we wanna be able to share that widely. And so we work in a number of ways to share that data with interested partners. And so we've worked across local government to get the data into the hands of stakeholders. Um, but that data is also posted online. So if anyone's interested in any of the coastal data that we have in Maine, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm more than happy to share it with you and find ways that we could collaborate to help communities. I personally have taken the approach of it's, I'm way better off sharing data and being open. Uh, and I think we're, we all kind of can do better um, when we work together that way, rather than kind of hogging the data to ourselves. I, I totally get why some people in some industries can't do that. But in academia, we're kind of fortunate enough to be able to just share openly. And I hope that kind of spurs innovation, collaboration, and working together. Because this is such a huge problem that we're facing in terms of sea level rise and coastal change. Our coastal landscapes are going to be completely reorganized over the next century. This really is going to take all of us working together to try to figure out how to, you know, cheaply adapt to these environments to help the most people protect the ecosystems and ensure that we have, you know, continuing thriving and resilient coastal communities. So always open to collaborations. That's awesome. Well, that's the perfect segue, Will. So if folks want to contact you, what is your email address? How can they get a hold of you email or otherwise? Yeah, so that I am uh, one of a few Katitskis in the world. So if you just Google Will Katitsky, W-I-L-L and K-O-C-H-T-I-T-Z-K-Y, you'll pretty much just find me. My website's iceandclimate.org. So my, uh, you know, a lot of my work's there. My student work is there. But yeah, very happy to to talk more. Always happy to connect and collaborate and talk about GIS and what we have going on in Maine. Awesome. Well, this is a really fun conversation for our folks, our listeners, as always. If you have a question you want to tackle on this show, please drop me a line at chris at Visit ydqa.io or submit it to the Drone Launch Connect community. Until next time, have a great week.